In this edition of Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners, we talk about fall webworms and all those webs up in the trees, the secrets to growing beautiful hydrangeas, and since this is the best time of year to plant trees and shrubs, we'll discuss how to plant those trees and shrubs for best results. Welcome to Garden Talk. Well, here we are once again. Welcome to uh, edition number four of the uh, Garden Talk podcast with the Tulsa Master Gardeners. We're here with Brian Jervis and myself, Tom Ingram. We're glad you're here. And we think we've got some good topics for you this week that are kind of pertinent now in the fall. So um, I don't know. Let's get started. I'm, I'm ready. I mean, this year we got to talk weather first. I mean, we finally broke this weather. Uh, September was a hot, hot month, and uh, we're glad for it to be over. And I think the plants are too. They're kind of they're starting to show some fall signs. You know, the leaves are starting to starting to curl, kind of turn a little. Right. Um, but but the plants are starting to think about it. So we're we're excited, and I'm very excited that we've got some better well, it, weather. It was kind of an endurance to to get to where we are, but now we got like in the 30s this weekend maybe that's or right that's right so anyway football weather is here <laughs> football weather <laughs> and some garden issues there's still garden issues in the fall so absolutely we'll start with our pest of the week this week pest of the week is a uh, fall webworms we're starting to see them like this in the trees out and about i mean some years they just explode and it seems like everywhere but this year's not too bad but they are they are there seems to be uh okay this year i mean we're, right. we're gonna have them year after year um so you're gonna start noticing these uh the first generation we're gonna start noticing in july tom right um so that's that's kind of the first generation they, they've done their thing um so after that then they kind of go back to the tree kind of go dormant a little bit and then they start up the second generation the generation we're seeing right now they'll do that in august and september they'll feed and and that's where we're that's where we're starting to see a lot of issues or damage is that second generation that's defoliating well, trees in certain and we'll start points. seeing stuff like this once those numbers start yeah. building up again it looks like this and it's that's, kind of creepy looking a little bit you look up there and that, that thing is alive it yeah. is moving it is it has motion and those things are moving they have so they lay they've laid their eggs on underneath the leaves and then that egg is kind of went to a pupa and then they're they're having to feed they're having to continue and, and start getting bigger and bigger so that's where they're at right now they're feeding um they've done a lot of feeding now they're kind of back into that nest if you will for the for their last part of their life well and when we're talking we call, they call them fall webworms they look like this they're not necessarily worms they're caterpillars caterpillars yep but yep. we call them fall webworms but i mean they're kind of cool looking when you look at them up close and individually but as as a horde of a thousand of them they're a little bit intimidating they're, they're a little intimidating uh they'll they you'll the most of their life they'll stay within that bag or that net that that web that we oh, showed, just keep showed expanding them. just kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger and then when they feed of course they're going to get out a little bit or get you know kind of move that net move that bag or that web as they feed so uh well, yeah they, i think the next slide you well they start like this yeah this is eggs. so this is the adult that's laid the eggs on the underside of the leaf the adult moth the adult moth right and uh, so that moth will lay eggs. So the first generation, May, June, uh, they'll lay these eggs. It'll take a few days, 10 to 14 days, depending on temperature and weather. Uh, those eggs will hatch. They will hatch and then pupate, uh, pupate and then go into their process. Feed pretty much uh, throughout July where we mentioned earlier that we will first start seeing them. Right. So they, then they'll kind of run that process again for that generation, then they'll pupate. Then we start going back to then this. Then they'll start going back <laughs> to this. So I guess long story short, couple generations a year, right. um, if we control them, if we, if we spray them in that first generation, theory says that we will be better off, have less of a population in the fall. Right. But our neighbors don't control them or two neighbors down don't control them we've got a pretty high population anyway so uh, a lot of the times the the mother nature controls it whether we're too wet and fungus gets in them and it kills them a lot or it's too dry it desiccates them they can't survive so that's pr probably what's happened this year is we were pretty wet this year so they they've got too wet they had some fungus that kind of kept them at bay at, uh, under control right. and uh, so that's that's probably what's happened why we're not seeing as many compared to last year and two years ago where we were covered uh, right. most of our pecans most of our walnuts were just 
totally covered. So good years like that, they will spread to ornamentals, uh, different ornamental trees, whether it's right. oaks. They love the fruit uh, and then the pecan and the nuts. They, they've got a sweetness to those leaves that they, they like. So that's what's happening there. So they have there. a sweet tooth. Well. They, they do, they do. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, well, and, and the, each mama can lay like four to 500 eggs. So you can see how if you had four to 500 that grew up and then the next generation eats one of those, or half of those, I guess, yeah. have another four to 500 each. It's it can get out of, out of control pretty, that, that's right. pretty quick, that's which right. is where we get our deforestation. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Bird, birds will control. Let's go into control. Um, so, you know, I think that, so yeah, control options, you know, they're pretty easy to control. They've got, um, they're soft-bodied worms or caterpillars, so right. any type of insecticide or even insecticide soap will kill them. But as you saw with those webs, they're, they're protected in there. Right. So we're up there with our pump-up sprayer, getting about 15 to 20 feet in the air is about as far as we can reach with that pump up sprayer. And then at 15 foot, it's hard to get that stream of water inside that web. Well, we don't have the horsepower the power, the to power penetrate to get that it web there. like the commercial sprayer. That's sort. correct. So, you know, a pecan, or, a pecan orchard, they have air blast sprayers that they pull and it'll shoot air up into that canopy which is really nice because it'll get into that and they'll, mm. they'll control them that way. Right. Control for a homeowner is not necessary. Um, you know, year after year, if we defoliate early in the fall, every year it'll kind of slow them down a little bit, the trees. Right. But for the most part, they're mature trees. They're not gonna get, they're not gonna be harmed by fall webworms for the most part. Well, it's kind of unsightly. I know <clears throat> at the end of our street where I live, where there's a large pecan tree in their front yard. And that thing will get completely defoliated. It'll just be down to sticks. Yeah, and you think, yeah. well, this tree is done. But then next spring, pops right back. It's back up. and it looks fine. Yeah, so, so the bottom line is that you're probably going to be okay. It's going to be unsightly. Yeah, yeah. And not look very good, but they're not going to destroy the tree. Yeah. Unless it's a maybe a, a damaged or a... Or, or a young tree. young tree. So a tree you just transplanted that needs all of those leaves on there for the whole right. season to really get the roots established. Right. Um, a couple years of defoliating early uh, will, could harm it. But for the most part, we don't have to worry about it. just the sightliness is the issues. But BT works well. Right. Uh, BT is an organic uh, insecticide that if they are feeding, if they are actively feeding, we spray that, that, that bacteria on the leaves. They'll feed it, consume it, and they'll quit, they'll, they'll quit eating that way. So BT is a great product that will work well on these if they're feeding, if they're actively feeding. Right. And then a lot of other just general insecticides will work, but we've got to have have them outside that nest we've got to have them that spray get on them and then it'll die that way so horticultural uh, oil or soap uh, horticultural soap insecticide soap will work too the trick on any of this is get it inside that web get it inside yep I've heard some people say if you break up those webs to let the birds in but I don't know does that yeah I mean it can work just depends on your birds if you've got right. a lot of birds around they will they will feed but they'll they'll what the birds see them and they'll get into that webbing and then they'll fly away they won't eat them very well but if they get it exposed it, yeah there's a possibility right. but if you go through the trouble of, of pulling those webs spray some soapy water on there and that should help them and, and get them get them killed that way or if like in our first slide when it was just a smaller batch if you start to see that just cut that cut branch, that off branch off take it get away. rid of it and you've eliminated the yep. eliminated yep. the threat so yep. to speak so think ahead you know mark mm. your calendar down if you're starting to see them in june and july try to treat them and then that'll help you later on in the fall mm. and uh i think we'll be fine i mean it, it's one of those that happens every year and and um it's it's unsightly but it's not going to hurt anything one of my favorite stories was some gal walked into the our diagnostic center one day and we were talking about fall webworms and she said she actually gets a broom sticks it up in there and kind of winds it up like cotton candy <laughs> pulls it, it pulls out, it and, out like and dumps, dumps it in the trash away. i was like well okay that, whatever so works if it works for whatever you whatever works yeah yep, anyway. yep. so good all yeah, right good so fall webworms our plan of the week this week is one we're all pretty familiar with and it's a great one lots of showy flowers it's one of hydrangeas hydrangeas yeah that's it's one of our favorites i mean it it blooms it, it blooms pretty much 
year, you know, season season long. Right. Uh, we've got new ones that will do, you know, bloom on new wood. A lot of talk in the in the office, you know, is it, does it bloom on new wood or old wood? Right. Um, some of the newer newer varieties will bloom on new wood and old wood, so that will allow us to have flowers pretty much throughout the season. Well, I know we get people that come in their questions and they'll they'll say, well. I trimmed my hydrangea back last year, and I, I didn't get any any blooms this year. Well, odds are it was one of those varieties that blooms on the old wood. So if you cut off the old wood, you, you've cut off the you've cut off all your blooms. Yeah, and it's tempting to do that because they they just look kind of little kinda sticks straggling. sticking out there, and it's not very pleasant in your garden. But yeah. leave leave those if, if you've got that variety. If, if you, you want to know what your, what variety you have, that's right. right. That's right. If you want to hear me stutter and trying to answer a question answer a question of why my hydrangeas aren't flowering right because there's there's quite a few different things that it could be um you know fertilizer is probably the first thing that comes to mind us as homeowners have a tendency to over fertilize mm -hmm. um, when a plant's over fertilized it's growing vegetatively it's not worried about producing flowers it's comfortable in in its life cycle it it it's not worried about reproducing so it's not going to put more flowers on so if we're heavy in nitrogen it's going to grow uh, a lot of foliage not a lot of flowers so right. that's my first answer for why is your flower your your hydrangeas or other plants not flowering right. another one would be that too much shade uh, these hydrangeas, they're big leafed. Uh, most of them have big leaves, so they're going to need a little bit of shade. Uh, afternoon shade is a great, great thing to say on most of these hydrangeas. Now, some can handle full sun, but they're going to do the best when they're protected in the summertime from about 3 till, you know, 7 or 8 in the afternoon during that I, heat. I, I know in, in my yard, I've got several hydrangeas, and you know, at July, August, where it's 102 or whatever, you'll, you'll, I'll look out there and they'll just be they start drooping they're just down, like wilting drooping down. and looking terrible. But uh, you know, you wait till the sun down and you look out there and they'll be Pop coming right back, back up. It's those big again. leaves that transpiration. Yeah, right. Yep. I mean, they're yep. losing water faster yep. than they can suck it up. Yeah, and we've grown them a bunch throughout you know May and June, trying to get a lot of foliage out there. And sometimes we put too much, and that's what's happened. We've grown them too much in the in the May June time, and then right. July and August comes and they just start wilting. And and sometimes they'll wilt enough to burn on the outside of the edges. So if if we do if we are doing that it may be too much sun um, or it could be just the tendency of it to you know we could have some hundred degree weather that just drying them out it just can't pull it up enough water to cool itself down they're just in survival mode that's right <laughs> but hydrangeas are great there's a lot of different sizes shapes um, kind of a unique characteristics is you can change the color on well yeah a that's, few that's of another one of the questions oh I, there you go minor minor pink or, or I want blue ones or whatever did I buy the wrong ones well you can shift it with the pH. Yeah, yeah, you can. So, um, so on the pH, you know, we, we've got a, a a lower pH, so around the five fives. And help me if I'm wrong. I think if if we're that, on that'll five, be the blue. The that blue would be, be the, the lower pH. So right. a low pH and acid soil is going to have a blue color to right. it. And then if we raise that pH, getting in into the six and sevens it will have a tendency to be pink. Right. So, and we can switch them. And in some cases that plant can have two different colors right. uh, at, at one. Depending on how, depending on how wide or a job you did on spring there. But you can go to the nursery or the garden center and I mean, you can actually buy a container, blue hydrangeas, pink, pink hydrangeas. hydrangeas. It's got all the stuff in there and yep. you can yep. dump that out there and help shift Ship the Ship pH in the direction you yep. want to so, go. Yep. So so sulfur lowers pH. So anytime if we want to, if we're going from pink to blue, we we put some sulfur on there. Right. Um, ballpark around a hundred square feet, uh, about two pounds of sulfur for a hundred square feet. So that's going to lower us down a little bit. And on the other end of that spectrum, we're going to raise soil pH with lime. So on that, we put about eight to ten pounds per hundred square feet of lime. It's going to take a little while. It's going to take right. three to six months, depending on your soil type and how it's made up. But it will eventually change it and, and change some colors on those. So right. yeah, it's kind not, of a fun thing about hydrangeas. It's not one of those that you buy the color change and you go out and sprinkle 
to go out and sprinkle it on it. Go out the next morning and yeah. expect it to be a different yeah. color. But but I'd go out to the nurseries. These are you know everybody needs a hydrangea. There's usually an area in your flower bed that's that's shady enough or you know afternoon shade. Um, hydrangeas will be a good choice. They love high organic matter, uh, well well watered, well drained. Uh, they they will do great. But and fall. Fall, fall's a good time as well. Fall, you know, planting right now is a good time for right. those as well. Nursery stocks getting, you know, they're 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 going to have some good deals out the nursery. Um, but I, I think I think you'll love a hydrangea. Lots of sizes, shapes. I think the next slide. Well, oh, it's the one we tend to forget a lot of times when we're talking hydrangeas. But it's the oak leaf it, hydrangea. Oak leaf, yeah, right. oak leaf's cool. It it it's a real, it's one that'll handle full sun. That it'll you, you know you can plant it out directly. Um, but these flowers will tend to stay around all a lot all winter. Uh, they'll use them for dried arrangements um, right. throughout the winter as well. But um, great, great plant. Again, different sizes. You can get up to six to eight foot tall on right. the full size oak leaf, or you can get kind of a peewee version that doesn't get much more than two foot tall. Right. So just like any other varieties, they, they do well. But again, um, this one does, does good on old wood. It flowers good on old wood, so we don't want to do a lot of pruning on that. Right. But like yeah. I said earlier, this, the, newer, the newer varieties like Endless Summer, uh, there's quite a few different newer varieties that will bloom on new wood, and uh, that, that can help us as well. Right. One thing I forgot to mention on the, uh, the other variety of hydrangeas, they, sometimes a hard freeze if we have a really cold winter since they do bloom on old, old wood and those buds, and those are, buds already are already up, set. Up high. If they freeze those, you're not going to get yeah, any flowers. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, have, I mean, we got weather, we got pH, we got all these things. To yeah, there's work. a lot of different issues that it could be. And, you know, I, pruning, just be careful about pruning too much on any of them. Um, right. You know, I've got one that's about waist high, and it, it's just, it doesn't flower very well, but it's on the north side of my house, and it doesn't get a lot of sun. And I think that's what I blame. My wife was asking me a month ago why isn't it blooming, and I, it just doesn't have enough sun. So I've got a choice whether I want to pop it out of the ground, and it's it's big. Whether I want to pop it out of the ground and move it to a sunnier location, or just kind of live with what it is, and I'm living with it right now until and the, it, and the it, scales are tipping. Yeah, that's right, that's <laughs> right. But you know, it, it you know why is my why is the hydrangea not blooming? That's a fun, tough question, and and it's a harder question. But I start with fertility, then I go to sun, and then I ask about your pruning. Um, so there's quite a few things that it could be, and sometimes. Who knows? It just may not. It may not be happy there for some reason, and it may not ever flower like you would like it to. So, right. if that's the case, pop it out of the ground, move it to another location, and see. And then, if that doesn't work, pull it out and get another one. Yeah, good plan. Don't give up on it. Looks looks great. Got to have one. Mm -hmm. Got to have one or two in your yard. Definitely, definitely. All right. Great. Moving on to uh, now's the time. Now's the time. We've been talking planting shrubs and things. Now, now it's fall is the time to plant trees and shrubs. Perfect timing. Um, you know, trees and shrubs. The soil is still warm. Um, we still have from you know left over for that heat from the summer. So we, we get a plant in there. We put a, a tree or shrub in there and we put it in the ground. We're still going to grow roots, and that's kind of what we're doing. We're trying to trying to get that thing established and, and a little bit of roots grown before we get into dead of winter. And fall's the perfect timing because you know we don't have a lot of transpiration. It's cool out there. The leaves are on most deciduous still, but they're not doing a lot. But what it's doing, it's producing a little bit to start growing roots. And that's that, you know, the, the more roots we can grow before we get into the summertime, right. the better off we're going to be. So fall is the best time to plant. And there's a specific couple specific one types of shrubs and trees um, that we will buy that needs to be done in the fall. So, and I right. think our next slide is is what I was talking about. So, three different, about three different types that we'll see in the nurseries. The one on the left is going to be a, a bare root, and a bare root's kind of a specialty one. We, we'll see those in roses. You know, maybe in the springtime, where we don't have any, we don't have a lot any soil around it. Uh, there may be some sawdust or some shavings or some right. wood that's around it just to kind of hold those roots in. But for the most part, it's going to be soilless. Where it, you will take that plant and you'll see bare roots and a little stem. A lot of times, it's going to be a little seedling that we're going to see and going to see bare roots. So well, it's like, and a lot of times it's what you might get if you order from a catalog. 
catalog. That's correct. If you order from a catalog, they're not going to ship. They're not going to ship anything <laughs> with heavy soil. No, in they're going to ship you like the yeah. The so they they'll they dig those in the wintertime. Once the leaves fall off, they will store those in a cooler. It's kind of like produce, if you will, oh. where you'll you'll dig them. They'll wash the roots off. They'll bundle them all up, and then they'll put them in a cooler to go through a chill period. And after, you know, once they sell them, they'll start pulling them out, packaging them, uh, where it's still winter time, it's still cold, where the buds aren't bro opening up. So we can ship those all winter long and be just fine. Hmm. Um, so, but the timing on these are really got a, got a narrow window. So we've got to plant them before they start budding uh, in the spring. And then, you know, basically throughout, you know, February, March timeframe is our window to plant these, these bare roots on right. that. But we're not going to deal with a lot of those in the nursery, but bare root is a type that they may see. Uh, I think the per the the roses where they'll have right. that tube right. and then, you know, sawdust in that is what I think. But we'll give away and, and other other agencies will give away seedlings in the spring and usually those are going to be bare root where we can ship, you know, 500 trees in one package right. um, and then give them away that way. Typically, if we go out to the nursery, we're going to see one of these other ones, either, That's either correct. B and B, the bald and bald burlap, burlap, or the or container. The one that we think we all, you know, we probably see the most of is the one on the far right, uh, which is a container-grown plant. So all the roots are in that container; they're growing right there. Um, you're not disturbing the roots at all. But there is some issues with those if we don't re pot those from from you know a few a month or two months depending on the plant so um, but that's a container grown plant that's a that one we can plant year round that's the one we're going to be able it already to plant. has a root it system. has all the roots intact they're not they're not disturbed um, one issue is we may start seeing circling roots at the bottom right. if those plants yeah. haven't been repotted in a year or three months depending on you know what what type of plant that is um, then we could get into some root circling issues so when we pull them out look at them if we've got circling roots we can kind of massage those roots to spread them out or just simply get after them and cut them spread them out and put them in the ground they should be fine they should right. be fine so that's container grown they have all kinds of sizes anywhere from a quart size on up to 30 to 40 gallon size right. on a container yeah. Now, bald and burlap, <clears throat> you have to be a little more careful with those when you're planting them. So bald and burlap, what's happened, these are usually field-grown plants. We grow them like corn in a, in a, in a garden or in a field right. in a row. And then once they get to size, they'll go in and harvest them. They'll simply dig a trench around, make, leave, that, leave a ball intact, and then put, put a wire basket and burlap around it to hold it in. Then they can ship it that well, they've way. they've got those special diggers. That's right. right. Go down, That's right. Go down pop them up. up, and put a burlap and a wire basket around it, and then they can move them that way. Right. These are heavy. These are these are pretty expensive. The major expense is is packaging them and getting them to the nursery. So because that's going to be soil, and you know how big a five gallon bucket of soil is, how heavy that is. Right. It's pretty heavy. Right. So um, you know that, but it's it's a cheap way to grow a lot of plants to get them you know to get them grown and then somehow get them to the nursery. So um, we're cutting a lot of the roots off when we package those. So fall planting of bald and burlap is pretty essential. Some trees and shrubs can handle the spring, but a lot of the times we need to focus on planting these in the fall because we've removed a lot of roots. They haven't reestablished roots, so we need to get them in there, grow those roots like we were talking about at the first, where they'll start growing out, where they can start pulling up moisture, start growing a little bit and getting established. So. Well, and it seems like one of the main issues too between spring, summer, or fall planting is water. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the earlier you're planting them, the more you're going to be watering. Yeah. If you yeah. plant them in the in the fall, you're still going to have to water. But if you're planting it, something in the spring, you better be out there every day. You better be on it because, you know, we still, in you plant them in April, April, May, June's pretty, pretty good. But we, we don't have roots yeah, growing out. Yeah, built up the roots. So there. we have to water every day, every other day. Then when we get into July and August, we better, we better have it somewhat established or we're going to have to water every day or it's not going to make it. It's just going to never establish well right. so fall again that's why fall is the best time to do that because like we mentioned that warm soil temperature and we're not transpiring a lot of a lot of water and they've got all winter to 
to kind of establish a, in, a, set a root in. system yep. and get set and braced for our Oklahoma summers, yep. like we kind of brace ourselves. That's right. <laughs> so. Speaking of bracing, the next slide. <laughs> um, this is kind of kind of a, a diagram of how we plant a tree. And you know, we think, yeah, everybody knows how to plant a tree, but but uh, there's, there's a one few. mistake we've all made that I've made is just digging the hole the size and, of the of the pot yep. and, and putting it in yeah. the ground and it being too deep. Um, yep. Being too deep is one of the and major not, not major issues, and not and not wide enough. Being too deep is one of the major issues that we when we plant the tree. We want when we're done planting, we want to be able to see a root flare at the bottom of that soil line. So if we get that tree planted and we don't see a root flare, then we've planted that thing too deep. Most all trees are going to have somewhat of a flare, and it's hard to see on this diagram. Right. But right yeah. at that base, that that trunk is going to flare out to start setting roots. And and if it's underground, if it's underneath the soil, that those cells around that base of that trunk, it has to have oxygen, it has to have air, it has to be dried out. So if we've got soil around it or mulch around it, then right. it can't dry out. So that's one major thing that we've got to see. So when we plant a tree, we plant it the size of the, the, the height. We don't go any deeper than, we don't dig that hole any deeper than the height of that container, but we can go two to three times as wide as that container. Right. So if we're planting a, a five gallon pot, you know, you're gonna plant it about, you know, 18 inches, it's gonna be about 18 inches deep. Um, and then it, it can be three to four feet wide. It don't have to be four feet, but two to three feet wide, two or three times the width of that pot. Well, in the the main reason for that is the the soil the soil's compacted and mm -hmm. harder, mm -hmm. so you create a, a circle of looser soil. It's going to be easier for those roots to grow and to, get established. To get in there, rather than running into some hard clay soil and yeah. just like hitting, and then just hitting, hitting a, a brick wall and yeah. they can't go anywhere. Hitting a bathtub essentially, and, <laughs> and some bathtub. soils are crappy like that. A lot of you probably have those soils. Right. So the kind of the way we overcome that is dig a little bit dig, dig a little bit wider, and then we also plant it a little bit higher. Right. So in, in general, it's a good rule of thumb, the nastier the soil, the higher the plant can be planted at. So we'll allow water to drain off. That's basically all just water draining off that, that top. You can leave that whole pot a third above ground. It won't hurt a thing. That whole root ball can be a third above ground. Mm -hmm. If we've got crappy soil, it's better to plant it high like that to where that water will get off there and drain and it won't drown. Rather it, than, it, than to a bucket, bucket it to go. where it'll just hold water, a bathtub of, uh, effect essentially. Right. So the nastier the soil, the higher it is. And in this picture, you're, you're a couple inches higher, uh, which is, you know, not too bad. And we see a flare, we see a root flare. Now what um, about those support? So, you know, depends on if it's needed. Um, I, I wouldn't just say every time we need to go ahead and put depending stakes on, height, on. depending a, on height, yeah. depending on how much wind we get through there, right. uh, we may be protected enough where we don't get a lot of wind. Uh, the, the major reason to that is to, to, to set that root ball and where that root ball does not move. And once we get it planted, if the root, once we water it in and we shake it a little bit, and if that root ball's not moving, I don't think we need to need to put stakes on there. But if we do shake it and see that root ball moving a little bit, if you think about it, those little bitty roots are going into that new soil. Right. And if that root ball moves at all, it's going to snap those little tender roots. Right. So then we got to start all over. Right. So I mean. It, if the plant is moving, go ahead and put a couple stakes on there, maybe three to help kind of hold it together. Um, staking's an art. Um, one thing, you know, do I need two stakes or do I need three? And that you want it to move a little. You want that trunk to move a little. It helps in the growth and development of that in establishment. But we don't want to lock it down. We don't want to use those, you know, those cloth stakes right. to lock it down where it doesn't move at all because then it won't be strong whenever we go to take those stakes off. Speaking of taking stakes off, when do we need to remove the stakes? And my answer is, is unwind, you know, after, you know, say you plant it in the fall like you're supposed to, and then you come back in the spring and trying to decide if you want to remove the stakes. Take off the stakes, shake that trunk a little bit, look at that root ball and see if it's, see if it's in there, see if it's halfway established. And if it doesn't move, you can pull the stakes off. 
The stakes sometimes can be used kind of as a barrier to keep weed eaters away because right. um, we have a tendency to run our mower right up next to that trunk or that weed eater right up next to that trunk. Right. And if stakes are there, it'll some it'll keep us further away from that. So that's that's another reason we can use the stakes. But usually within six months to a year, we can get those off and, and be fine. So Well, and also what's key is, is uh, we've got that area that's two or three times bigger than the the plant itself yep. and uh, is to mulch that that's right, right. mulch that and keep it clear of grass because the grass is going to be competing with the roots so Gr put it in mulch but keep that mulch away from the from the trunk from the trunk one of our major issues is you know competition is that grass and you take a you know it's hard to believe but you take a two inch caliper tree you plant it in a bermuda lawn in full sun and in three months, that you know, three months of growing conditions in the summer, that grass can be growing in that mulch. You've got moisture, you've got nutrients. Um, that that Bermuda is going to go into there. Right. So controlling that grass around that area is very important to get that tree established. Now, five years from now, um, you know, we see gr trees growing in in yards without mulch. Um, but I think the first three or four years, it needs to be mulched in to help, you know, kind of insulate it, help do what mulch does, hold moisture in, hold the, hold the weeds down. Um, and then our Bermuda grass that's growing around needs to be controlled um, as, as needed, usually two or three, every two or three months, mm -hmm. whether, we, whether we hand pull it or whether we spray it. But we have grass killer that'll just kill grass and not kill the tree. So try to do that versus our glyphosate um, products where it can get into the trunk and kill the tree so we've got to be careful about that but we've got grass killer that can do that a couple types well when we're talking about mulch and around trees it's one of my pet peeves it seems like i drive all around town and i see stuff like this that, that they whatever it is that's a crepe myrtle or whatever then they've got the mulch and it looks real nice and it's just volcanoed up to yes the top it's just a it? volcano up yeah, there yeah. well the key is we, we said we want the mulch to retain moisture well yeah. it's going to retain moisture but it's going to retain the moisture on that trunk on that trunk yeah. and that's the warm moisture heat that's just a perfect breeding ground for disease yeah disease and so, insects and insects. insects as well so insects that's, as well so yeah i mean there's a lot of businesses around that are you know are, are landscape companies i don't want to talk bad about them but i will when i see that volcano old mulch up up around and some uh, of those guys you know some of those guys and gals they don't they don't understand but you know if we're seeing volcano up that we've got to get that pulled off or we will have issues that shrub or tree will will end up dying so right. yeah so just a reminder this is what not to do do not volcano not. <laughs> it up yeah and you know how, how long do i need the mulch i mean it, i think it looks better i think it, it you know that 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 mulched tree keeps your weed eaters away from it right. and you know that weed eater blight uh, when we damage that trunk it's like cutting our skin that tree's got to heal or our skin's got to heal. If you cut it every week. Yeah, if you keep nicking it, keep nicking it, keep nicking it, you're right. gonna expose disease, expose cankers, and then you're gonna more likely lose right. it at that point. So keep it mulched, keep the grass away from it, plant it correctly, and plant it in the fall. Good time to do it. So that's a pretty All good right. seg segue to the next one, I think. Well, our question this week, we're moving to question of the week. Question of the week, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get talking amongst ourselves and forget you all here. But anyway, the next, this question comes from Renee. We got into our diagnostic center. It says, we have three overgrown holly trees. What's the best time of the year to do serious pruning shaping? She said serious. Serious. Serious pruning shaping. She does not want to tweak. She's wanting to do She's serious pruning shaping. She's wanting to come back shaping. and cut. And so. uh, th this is an example of like, this one could use some serious trimming a little on it bit to shape of shaping. it up. Yep. Um, serious, serious pruning probably be done in the springtime uh, or dead of winter. Um, what happens now in the fall, if we prune back our roses or prune back any of our shrubs, they have a chance to re-sprout and re-bud and regrow new growth. And that new growth can be tender and maybe not survive the winter time. So then, then in the spring, once it starts growing, we get a lot of dead black leaves that have just died from the winter. Um, so if we wait till it's totally dormant, till we know it's not going to grow and re-sprout new growth, then that's probably the, one of the better times to, to do a, a major pruning. Um, can be done year round. Um, you know, something this tall, in general, you don't want to remove more than one third right. of the tree at one time. Now, some shrubs can, can be chopped 
back hard and it won't hurt them. Uh, it, it won't, it, it won't, they will be able to survive it. Right. Some shrubs, we can't remove more than one third. So it's really, you know, know what your shrub is, call us in the office, see if we can, you know, if it will take a full pruning or maybe just a regular pruning. And that, that, that's kind of, um, the way we look at that, but I'm, I'm a pruner. If, if I've got a, a, a rose bush or a holly that's in my walkway, or if it's in my windows where it's rubbing the windows at the house, um, I'm going to get in there and get that out of there. I'm going to prune it pretty hard regardless right. of timing. Right. Um, now, you know, like I said, there's better times than others, which dead of winter is going to be your better, better time. But it, you know, if it's in the way or it looks unsightly or if it's got out of hand, I'm, I'm going to go in there and prune it out uh, regardless just because I, uh, it's unsightly and we need to get it out. We need to well, clean it up a little bit, essentially. Right. Pruning can be complicated because is now the time to prune this? Yes. Is now the time to prune that? No. no. So on our website, if you go to our TulsaMasterGardeners.org website, Lawn and Garden Health, we've got a whole uh, pruning calendar. Yeah. And we yeah. list a ton of uh, different varieties when to prune, how to, how prune, to prune, when not to prune, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So rather than just say, well, it's spring, I should prune, check and make sure. Check and make sure. Because if it was your hydrangea and you prune. That's right. You prune the flowers off or right. azaleas or, you know, in general, azaleas, spring, right. spring flowering shrubs set flower buds late summer. Okay. So late summer is when they're setting their flower buds, you know, September, August that time frame, so they're setting flower buds, those buds sit dormant all winter, and then once it kind of breaks dormancy, then they'll start flowering like our, our azaleas. So if we go in and prune those in the wintertime, we're cutting a lot of flowers off of that. Right. So keep that in consideration. Are you, is that plant there for the flowers? And if it is, it, say our azalea bush is tall, kind of like this, um, out, of, out of whack, but we want the flowers. So we would hold off until after they flower in the springtime to prune. Right. If we don't care about the flowers, get in there and prune them in the dead of winter and we should be all right. But we're going to take flowers off. You're going to have less flowers um, on those on those spring flowering plants. Well, and sometimes I know people ask and say that I've got something that's just out of control. Can I prune it now? Well, yes, but you're not going to get the flowers. That's right. But you know, you got to weigh the you got to figure out what you yeah. pros and cons. It needs to be cut back because yeah. it's up against the house yeah. or whatever, yeah. whatever. So sometimes you may have to prune and then skip a year, yeah. and then next the following year it'll be healthier and that, look better. And you've you that's know. right, that's right. And hollies, hollies in general. On her question, you know, now I mean, hollies will handle a pruning. They're tough as a boot. Right. So um, she can, if she can wait another, you know, we're around November time frame now. If she can wait uh, a month or two till they go to solid dormancy, then she can get in there and prune them and not have to worry about new sprouts coming out, new new buds coming new out. New tender buds That's that are right. going to get damaged That's by right. the cold. That's right. right. So hopefully right. that answered her question. All right. Next question we've got, it comes from Ed. He says, with all the humidity, yes, we've had the humidity. Several of my plants have a white powdery substance on them. What should I do? And likely he's talking about this right here, powdery mildew. Powdery mildew. It seems like it's all over yeah. right now. Yeah, right now it's kind of, you know, plants have done their thing right. and they've kind of got lazy and they're just, they, they're not growing a lot right now. So diseases, fungus are getting in and taking over because they're kind of done their thing. Um, we can spray a couple different types of fungicides on them, you know, one for a couple times and then switch fungicides after that um, so they don't get um, so they don't get used to it and and uh, so that that was one that that can work well. They they we spray that on there and it, it kind of covers them and, and takes care of it. But um, this time of year, not a lot of need to do that. I know we were talking before, your flocks has it. Right, it's covered um, in it. Covered in it. You know, you, you, can, you can let it go, let it go dormant, let, let the leaves fall off, gather those leaves up if you want to. There's plenty of spores around to go around for next year, but the more you take away by gathering those up, the right. less you're gonna have essentially next year. So I'd let them fall, gather them up, and then go on. Uh, at this time, I don't think we need to justify a fungicide application. Right. 
Well, and the key, I think, too, is that these leaves, once they get to looking like that, there's no really coming back from that. That's right. You're basically, your sprays would be a preventative to keep it from spreading. That's is that, that right? That is correct. Right. Or protecting the newer leaves that right. are coming out. I right. mean, in September, we still had new leaves coming. You know, we're in November now where there's not a lot of new stuff happening. So I, I would, um, yeah, this leaf is going to go from white to kind of yellow to brown. It's just going to kind of suffocate it and kill it. Right. But we're also into the fall, too. Too, right. So uh, it's one of those that I don't know if I'd worry about it too awful much. But another thing is the disease triangle. You have a you know you have a moist environment. You have a susceptible host, and then you have a fungus that's out there. All three of those create the disease. So we we switch our irrigation. You know we've got a garden flocks that you know it just gets powdery mildew year after year, well, we're spraying overhead sprays on our beds. So we may can switch that to just do a drip irrigation where those leaves are drier for a little longer period. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna help decrease the amount and the pressure that we have on diseases. This year's a little more challenging with Mother Nature and how much water we had because it stayed wet a long time. Right. Therefore, we're gonna have more disease. So there's different cultural things that you can think of, think about to help prevent this during next year's growing season. But this time of year, it's probably best just to let it go. I'd kind of let it go. They can prune it out or let it fall and then gather those leaves is my answer to her. All right. Yep. Well, that wraps up another edition. We're glad you're here. Remember uh, to email us your questions. Call our Diagnostic Center. We'll pop up all the information here in the next few seconds. But uh, thank you. Glad to do it. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. See you next time.